I want Thanksgiving to be different. I don't want the holiday that takes heaps of planning and multiple trips to the grocery store only for it to just come and go. This year, there's not a hug I'll receive, not a door I'll walk through, not a person I'll visit that will be taken for granted. I want Thanksgiving to be different. In times past, we'd say the obligatory Thanksgiving prayer, hold hands, bow heads, fight eager appetites. This year, I want to feel the hunger, the eagerness to thank God for what we once hardly noticed, a quiet gratitude in our hearts for all the small things God's granted us. Whether the whole family is together, whether there's one seat or two left empty, if our table is full and abundant or feeling the sting of a hard year, whether we've seen deliverance through all things or received strength despite hard things, we will give thanks. When all is well or nothing looks right, if we've gathered with many or sit in quiet solitude, by the grace of God, we will raise our hands to the one who gives and takes away. So I come to the table on this special day and give thanks to the Lord for he is good his steadfast love endures forever that is how we make thanksgiving different
Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto Every promise we can make, every prayer and step of faith, every difference we will make it is only by His grace. Every mountain we will climb, every You might ask yourself, why is he seeing this? What's this got to do with being thankful? But uh, it's thankful to me because I wandered so aimless, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light, no more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Just like the blind man, I wandered along. Worries and fears I claim for my own. Then like the blind man that God gave back his sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light, I saw the light, I saw the light. No more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Here's the sad part. I was a fool to wander and stray. Straight is the gate and narrow the way. Now I have traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight. 
Praise the Lord, I saw the light, I saw the light, I saw the light, I'm singing. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the day. We thank you for this opportunity to open your word, and we thank you that your servants thousands of years ago recorded it for us, and they, and your servants since have, have held it, um, preserved it. We know it's trustworthy. We know it's true. Um, and because of your faithfulness, we have your word to us. And so, Father, as we open it, we pray that you continue to be faithful to us, that we, when we ask for forgiveness, we know that you'll give us forgiveness. When we ask for wisdom, we know you'll give us wisdom. And when we ask for your spirit to move and transform our hearts and our minds, we know that he will do that too. And so, Father, that's what we pray for today. Give us a renewed vision for what you have. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we finish thanking God for his character, um, I want to read Exodus 34, 6 one more time. This is kind of the verse that we've been springboarding from, and this is, uh, this is, Moses has, is ready to lead the people uh, through the wilderness, and, but he wants a vision of God really quick. And so God says, well, I'll, I'll pass by, but you're not, you're not going to see much because you can't see a whole lot. Um, but this is what the Lord says about himself as he passes by. It says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And so we looked at God as, as merciful. We thanked him for his mercy that he, he doesn't punish us as we deserve, but he offers his son um, as, so that we can have forgiveness, that, that he willingly forgives those that ask. And we thanked him for his grace last week that not only are we forgiven, but we're given eternal life, that we're transformed by his grace to, to live as he's designed us to live and to, to do the things that he's called us to do, that he gives us eternal life and he gives us uh, more than we deserve. Um, and then those, those next adages, we're having to skip just for the sake of time, but slow to anger really goes along with uh, his grace and his mercy that it really, it takes God a long time to get mad. Um, I mean, that's part of that, that infinite patience, um, but abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And so as we thank him for his faithfulness this week, that steadfast love and his faithfulness really go hand in hand. And so what we're looking at is, uh, is, what, is what, what is it to mean that God is faithful to us, and to help us out with that, um, we, we're, uh, the point in your bulletin there: we can trust the Lord to fulfill His promises because of His faithfulness. So when we think about promises that He's made to us. 
promises to save us, promises to transform us. We, we know he does that. He's proven himself faithful in, in centuries past. Through the, uh, as we read the Bible, we hear story after story after story of God's faithfulness to fulfill his promises. We know um, in our own lives, many of us can testify to those times when God said this is something that would be, and then lo and behold, long, you know, down the road, there it is, it, it's happened. Um, when God promises to provide for us, we've seen that provision. Um, I, I, I know personally there was a point in our, our family where I thought, you know, God, if you're going to provide, you're going to have to do something crazy because I don't, I, I can't do it. And, and it was, God did something crazy and it happened. And so we pushed through that. So we can trust the Lord to fulfill his promises because he's faithful. And one of the things that kind of tags with the video is one of the promises that we have that we're, we're still waiting on is that Christ is going to return. And all that we've talked about as far as his grace, his mercy, um, that's the ultimate fulfillment of that is when Christ returns and transforms this whole world. And so um, you, you may be thinking, God, this, this world, it ain't looking so hot. So, you know, how can we trust that you're going to be faithful to do the things that you said you'll do whenever look at what's happening all around? And as, as we think about this and, and as we look at what it means for God to be faithful, I go back to Hosea, and this, it's, it's one of my favorite stories, that, and, and I don't often preach it because, I mean, it's just one of those stories where um, it's, a, it's a little gut-wrenching. I mean, if you, if you read the first three chapters of Hosea, um, it's a short read, but it's one of those, like, it'll get you every time. And so, uh, so we're going to get you today. So let's look at Hosea, and we're going to read uh, verses 2 and 3 first just to kind of get started. It says, When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Now, I forgot a word of warning. The English Standard Version, like the King James Version, is very blunt in the character of this young lady. So if you are used to the NIV or some other translations that try to be a little bit nicer about it, um, apologies, I guess. So, But anyway... Uh, I mean, this is this is where it starts, and Jose, it's one of those funny stories because to me it's kind of funny because it's like, why in the world, why would God do this? Like, what's going on here? Well, a couple of things to keep in mind. One, Hosea is is in the line. He's he's a prophet. He's in the line of prophets of God, and uh, one of the thing about prophets is we tend to think of them as they they just get up and talk, and and people are supposed to listen when they talk, and that's that's a large part for sure. Um, but a lot of prophets, they were writers. They, I mean, like Jeremiah is one example where a lot of his prophecies were written down and they were passed out. Uh, just random story for you. One of the kings in Jeremiah's day did not like the prophecies that Jeremiah wrote down, so the king threw it into the fire, and Jeremiah's uh, assistant came and said, hey, the king burned everything that we wrote down. And Jeremiah said, oh, well, let's write it again. And so then he wrote it, writes it down again. And he doesn't give it to the king that time. He passes it, copies to the people. But that's just one of those things. Um, but one of the things also that prophets did was they would, they would do object lessons. There would, there would be times where there was like something going on, some, uh, like, like in Joel's day with the locusts that came, uh, that was an object lesson that, that God used to help Joel tell the people what was going to happen. Uh, again, with Jeremiah going down to the potter's house. The, I mean, it's, it's a simple thing, but the potter at the wheel, that was an object lesson for what was happening. Here God is saying, Hosea, I'm going to use your marriage as an object lesson for Israel. And, and Hosea must be a younger guy because he, he, doesn't, he doesn't have a wife yet. Um, but it, I want, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Like you're, you're getting ready to start a family. You're kind of looking at your options. And the Lord says, I need you to take a woman that, let's be honest, she's going to cheat on you a lot. Probably not the best criteria for a wife. Um, and, but it's one of those things where even though it looks weird on the surface, God is going to do something with this relationship. And Jose is faithful to say, okay, I mean, if, if that's what we're doing, God, that's what we're doing. And so he goes and he finds Homer, or excuse me, Gomer, uh, the daughter of Diblim, and uh, she conceived and bore him a son. Now, some theologians try to give her a little bit of leeway and say, well, she wasn't, maybe she wasn't a prostitute at first, but she just became one later. To me, that kind of takes away from the story. And, and either way, like, you know from verse two, this is not going to end well. This is not a type of marriage that you write home about, you know, you don't, you don't bring this lady home to mama. She's not gonna, she's not gonna approve, right? But Hosea does this, right? And it's because this is going to be a lesson. And so then as the chapter unfolds, 
uh, like I said, she, she bore him a son first, and his name is Jezreel. Uh, for those of y'all that are looking to have more kids, uh, some names you might consider, just throwing them out there. Um, you don't have to. It's okay. Uh, but Jezreel's named because he stands as a warning against King Jehu. Uh, random story from Second Kings. King Jehu wanted to take over the throne and take power. So what he did was he ordered uh, the 70 sons of King Ahab, who was the rightful king at the time, uh, their death. And then just to add insult to injury, he took all their heads and piled them in the Jezreel Valley. So just saying, Jezreel, I mean, it could work. Um, but the, but this son is, is now like a living testament to Israel's sin, that God is going to bring judgment because of, of what's going on, what happened there. And then next she has a daughter, uh, names, names her Lo Ruhama, which is literally translated no mercy. So Israel's had a long history of idol worship, violence, and now they're going to learn what it means to lack God's mercy. They have enjoyed God's mercy for a very long time at this point in the story, and God says, enough's enough. This, the, my mercy is going to be withdrawn from you. And what's going to happen is Israel is going to be taken over by Assyria uh, in the very near future. And then third, she has another son, uh, names him Lo-Ami, which is literally not my people. Um, you could also kind of think of that as like not my son, which is, that's, there's kind of a double entendre there where Jose at this point, he's recognizing that this woman is bearing children and they're probably not his children. This is, this is the height of dysfunction. This is one of those stories that reminds us that Bible's not always G-rated. Um, I mean, that's, it's, it's the truth. And, and to me, that's actually one of the glorious things about reading the Bible and, and reading even these parts where on Sunday morning you're like, preacher, where are you going with this, right? Because it reminds us it's real life. God addresses us as we are, not as we think we are. I mean, that's, that's one of the great wonders that God comes to us. He doesn't, he doesn't let us put on airs. He doesn't let us uh, say long, eloquent prayers and say, good job, you did good. He, no, he, he says things like, don't, don't pray like the heathens do. Don't pray like a hypocrite. Like, bring, bring me as you are. Come as you are. Not as you think I want you to be, but come as you are. Because whenever we come as we think we are, we're like the Israelites in Hosea's day. We, we, we do all the rituals. We, we, you know, we, we give our money. We give our, our grain offerings. We give this. We give that. We'll, we'll make sure we wash our hands properly. We'll do all these things. And God's just looking at him like, you guys are so far from me. You're, you're, you're worshiping other idols. You're, you're following after, you know, you have a king that has killed 70 people in order to gain power, and you're just letting him reign anyway. This is, this is, not, this is not how things should be. So Hosea is speaking into this. And so these three children, they're a threefold testimony against Israel's sins. Kind of think about this for a moment. We don't hear a lot about these kids after this. But just think about this. You have three children who grow up in this family, and, and they're, you know, this very dysfunctional family, to say the least. And they have to grow up with these names, and they have to, and their testaments, testimonies to Israel's unfaithfulness to God. Probably not the greatest situation. But Hosea, I'm sure, like, and this is me speculating, I'm sure Hosea took care of them. I'm sure they also went by their middle names, just throwing that out there. Um, but they, but this is, this is what happens. And so God tells Hosea, gives these instructions. He follow, Hosea follows these instructions. He has this family that is, is breaking apart, right? And there's nothing in the text that says that it's, it's necessarily Hosea's fault or she was raised the wrong way or some other such, such and such. No, she's, I mean, she's willingly cheating on him. So then, though, look in verse 10, because as we think, because I, I know it sounds like a horrible story, but um, the point you're bulletin, Gomer represents Israel who has abandoned God in favor of idols, wealth, and violence. So God does this, and he explains in chapter 1 that this is how Israel has behaved. What you're seeing in your family, Hosea, is how Israel is to me. And so Israel's now hearing, right, that family down the street that you tell your kids to stay away from because mama's crazy and the kids, you know, who knows, right? He's saying this is Israel. And so then we look in verse 10, though, and we get a wonderful promise. Look in verse 10. He says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered, and in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. And the children of Judah and of the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. 
It's an amazing promise. Now, it's an amazing promise, but it takes a little bit of breakdown because this far removed from Hosea's day, some of the things we kind of miss in, in, the, in our age. So look at it a little bit closely with me. First, the Lord says the children of Israel will be like the sand of the sea. Now, we, we get that, right? That means Israel's going to have a lot of kids. So even though God's about to bring great judgment on Israel, they're still going to have a lot of descendants. Well, why is that? Well, because it goes back to Abraham's day. And, it, and, it's a, and it, the phrasing is the exact same as it promised to Abraham. Abraham, your children will be like the sand of the sea. You count the stars if you can. Your children will be like the stars. What God is saying here is, look, I made a promise to Abraham a long time ago. And Abraham was faithful. Abraham did the things that I called him to do. And because of the promise I made to him, I'm going to fulfill that promise and I'm going to do the things that I said that we would do, right? And so then fast forward, right, through long ages of Israel's history of going back and forth, that whole time God still remembers his promise to Abraham, and God says, no, I'm going to fulfill that regardless of how messed up Israel is right now. And, and what it reminds us is despite the utter unfaithfulness of Israel, the Lord is going to be completely faithful to fulfill his promise to bless the nations through Israel. God is going to do what God said he was going to do. And it had nothing to do with Israel. It had everything to do with who he is. Second, the Lord says, where they were called not my people, they're going to be called children of the living God. This one points back to kind of that ancient polyistic way of thinking. This is one of those things that we miss in our modern day. Uh, a lot, in the ancient world, like every ethnic group, every country had their own set of gods for the most part. The Hebrew people were actually the weird ones because they only had one God. Um, and, but one of the ways of thinking about it was if, if one group conquered another group um, or, if, or if one group died out, then that meant that those people's gods were either uh, vanquished or they died out as well. So when Israel's about to get conquered, right? So for them to be conquered, that's like the Assyrians saying, our gods are better than your God and we killed your God, ha, ha, ha. And God's saying, there's going to come a point where it's going to be like, well, the Hebrews are lost. They have no country. They have no land. What's, you know, what's left of them? They don't even have their, their God. They don't have their religious system. And God says, no, I'm going to transform that to these are children of the living God. Saying, and it, basically this, these are the children of the one true God. That God's going to transform, even though they're about to see a large judgment, and they're going to see a lot of pain, they're going to see a lot of sorrow because of their sin, God's going to t do something amazing out of that. And then third, the Lord says Judah and Israel are going to be reunited, that they're going to have one head or one king. And at the time of Hosea, Israel's divided into two kingdoms. The, I think, you know, just random Bible trivia, a lot of times we think of Israel as one country, but they were really only reunited for a very short time. Uh, David unites the tribes, and he coalesces them into one kingdom. Solomon follows David, um, and then very immediately after Solomon, they get divided because there's, there's a fight over who should be next in the throne, and you end up having a split. And Hosea is saying, this actually should not be right. This is God's people should be one people. They should be united together as one, and they're not because of their sin. But here God says that there's going to come a point where they are reunited, that they will be one kingdom with one head. And we know that the fulfillment is in Christ, that because Christ has come, now not only are all the Jewish people under one king, but all Jews and Gentiles, that promise actually falls out to those of us that don't count ourselves Jewish, that we are part of that one kingdom as well. Then last, the Lord says, they shall go up from the land. Uh, the translation is right, but it, it can be a little misleading. And I was looking into this, and, and I came across a commentary, and he's, uh, he, he brings out this point. Most scholars think this means that return from the exile, right? Like the Jews are about to go out in the exile, and he's saying that they're going to return from the land. They're going to come out from the land and come back. There, there's, there's a long theological argument there um, that we can talk about another day. Um, but what it could point out is actually this is hearkening to the resurrection that's going to happen. That God's saying that not only, just as Israel is going to be resurrected, that the, the kingdom of Israel is going to be scattered, they're going to be conquered, they're going to be considered no more, but after 70 years they're going to come back. We read in Jeremiah, in 70 years they're going to come back. We read in Ezekiel that God's going to bring them back. That's what the Valley of the Dry Bones is all about. So there's several prophecies that when you take them all together, it might be that Hosea is not just talking about Israel coming back into their land, but also that there's going to be a time where God is going to raise up people from literally from the land, which we know is the resurrection. So this side of the cross, we know that part of Christ coming back is that the dead will rise, right? And some to everlasting punishment, but for those that are in Christ to everlasting life. 
And so death is not the end. And, and we're seeing here with Hosea's marriage, right? His marriage at this point, it's over. I mean, let's, let's face it. Like not even Oprah is going to be able to help this marriage. He's got kids that are probably not his. She's about to just leave the house and go into prostitution. This is a dead marriage. And it's a picture of what Israel was dealing with. Israel was a dead country. Now, they still had their king. They still had their trade. But this is a nation so far removed from God where God's just like, you know what? We're going to be done with this generation. This is, this is the situation that they're in. And so when we think about God's faithfulness to us, what this story reminds me is God's faithfulness to me has absolutely nothing to do with me. And I thank him for that. God's faithfulness to us as a church has absolutely nothing to do with us. It is all on him. It is all about his character and his desire to fulfill his promises. Flip over with me. Chapter 2 is, uh, is kind of a long poetry about the situation. Um, feel free to, to read that later on your own and meditate on it. There's some, there's some good verses in there, but we just don't have time to go through chapter 2. But chapter 3, though, we're actually going to read the whole thing because it's super short. But read with me Hosea chapter 3. And the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man, and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. By the way, that has to do with pagan worship. That has nothing to do with raisin cakes. So if you like raisin cakes, that's fine. I don't, but I'm just saying, like, you can, you can eat raisins. It's fine. Anyway, verse 2. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethek of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. So God tells Hosea, go love this woman again. I want you to kind of put yourself, I mean, guys, put yourself in Hosea's shoes at this point. Your wife has borne at least three kids that you know of. There's one you're pretty sure is not yours. The other two are questionable. She's now abandoned all of you. She's in a life of prostitution. She, she's a slave. That's why she has to be purchased. Um, apparently, she's a very expensive one because he has to pay in money and in food. Um, the word there for purchase has to do with haggling also. So it might be that Hosea actually had to haggle the price down a little bit. So for those of y'all that are missing the point there, she's not just a prostitute. Apparently, she's a pretty good one. This is the situation that he's in. And God says, because Israel's like this, and because of my faithfulness, I want to teach them a lesson. Go take her back. Go pay that price. Haggle if you have to, but go get her and bring her back into the house. This is the amazing grace that we sing about. This is the amazing mercy of God, and this is the amazing faithfulness that he has towards his people. That even we wander away, and we go into life that we know we shouldn't do, and we continue to do those same habits that we know we shouldn't do, and we continue to curse those that we know we're supposed to bless, we continue to hate those that we're called to love, despite all the things that we as sinful people do, God says, I'm not done with you yet. Come on back home, and we'll take care of it. That's God's faithfulness. And so God's faithfulness, it's not dependent on our faithfulness. This woman has done nothing to earn Hosea's love and affection. She's done everything to not earn Hosea's love and affection. But she's called back. She's paid for, and he brings her home. And then look again at verse 2. It illustrates one of the great truths. Hosea takes her in. But he tells her that this act of faithfulness to her is going to transform her. Looking at verse 2, I bought her for 15 shekels and the, and the homer and the lethek of barley. And he says to her in verse 3, You must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. Hosea has, has done an amazing act of grace because God has empowered him to do so. And then because of that grace, she's now going to be a changed woman. She's no longer going to live the life that she used to live. She's going to be different. She's going to be as she should have been to begin with. So when we receive God's grace, mercy, and experience his faithfulness, it transforms us. This, this is one of those things where 
I, I wonder sometimes if it disconnects with us. And, and, and I've fallen that trap too, where when we really think about it, and we just kind of sit down and think, all right, how much grace has God shown me? How much mercy has God shown me? And how much faithfulness has God shown me? And then sometimes we just we forget how much it is. But when, when we really start to wrestle with that, and when we actually receive it, right, we're not just showing up to church because we got to check a box or because somebody drug us or something, but we actually show up because we want to hear what God has for us. We want to experience that relationship with him. We go into our prayer closet and we actually pray because we want to hear from God and we're not just saying the blessing on the meal. We, we read our Bibles because we actually want to experience God's love for us and read about it and see what God has for us that day. When we do that thing, it transforms us every time. There, there's no way to experience the great love of God and then walk away like nothing happened. It just doesn't happen. So the disconnect there is if, if you find yourself in this rote pattern where you just think, well, yeah, God loves me, check. I, I know, I prayed, check, whatever, I say the blessing, check. And, the, and you, it doesn't change you. It doesn't transform you in any way. That's why I say you're doing it wrong. You got to go back and do it again. Go, go pray some more. Go read your Bible more. Because anytime we receive God's grace, anytime we receive his mercy, it transforms us. Now, this prophecy, though, of them coming back to the exile in the latter days, the people return to God, and they were praising for his goodness, this is all fulfilled in Christ. The last point there, God's faithfulness is embodied in Christ. Jesus is the son of David. Notice that God says they're actually going to seek King David. Well, at this point, King David is long in the grave. So what does he mean there? Well, he means David's son, Jesus Christ, who comes. That He's fulfilled. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians we're going to read a few verses in, in 2 Corinthians. Because Paul says something in passing, and it's Paul's one of those funny writers because he, he'll, he'll go really long on one point, and then he'll say something in passing that's very profound. You're like, Paul, why didn't you explain that? That was really profound. And this is what he does in chapter 1. Because it's sandwiched. This, what we're reading is actually sandwiched where he's talking about wanting to go visit some people, and then he just he says this really quick. And you're like, Paul, why did you say that? You should explain that. But, but read with me 2 Corinthians verses... Uh, 19, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 1, verses 19 through 22. Paul says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. <coughs> so again, it's kind of sandwiched there. And if you read it in context, it's like that doesn't really make sense. That just sticks out. But the, the point there is that all of God's promises are fulfilled in and through Christ. That every, every promise God has ever made, he says, is yes, because of Christ. So when we ask, God, are you, are you going to be faithful to provide for us? Yes, because Christ gives us provision. God, are you going to be faithful to show us mercy? Yes, because Christ demonstrated God's mercy. God, are you going to be faithful that even if I die, that I will still live? Yes, because Christ has died and Christ lives. All of God's promises are fulfilled in Scripture. So we, we come back to today, and, and, and a lot of times at Thanksgiving, you get in one of two camps. You're in the camp where you're really excited because you can't wait for that meal and you can't wait to see your family and it's, and it's good times and it's a celebratory time and, and you're just, and, and some of y'all are already ready for Christmas because you're so excited and, and it's okay. God will forgive that too, right? Be, but there are those also that Thanksgiving is, is the start of a horrible season because you, you've dealt with death, you've dealt with uh, infighting, you've dealt with loss of jobs. For some people, this year has been really good. For some, it's not been so good. But God's faithfulness to us, it's not contingent on the year we've had or even how well we've performed, we think, as Christians. God's faithfulness is because he is faithful. And so if you find yourself in a situation where you're just like, preacher, I don't have much to be thankful for. My life's a wreck. Marriage kind of looks like Hosea's. I don't know what to do. My kids are acting up. What, what, I don't know what to do. Go back to God because he is faithful. And despite everything that we deal with in this world, all of God's promises are yes in Christ. And that's, just not, that's not just a, a platitude to make you feel better. It's the truth. 
that when we go to Christ and we give him our cares, that he will take them and he will restore us and he will point us in the right direction. And even if it takes us longer than we'd like, we know that his promises will be fulfilled. Why? Because God is faithful to us. And so we don't have to worry about politics. We don't have to worry about this, that, or the other. We don't even have to worry about pandemics. We just have to sit and rest in the faithfulness of God because he is transforming this world. This world, it, yes, I understand, it's dying. The scriptures even says, hey, this world, it's a dead world. But it also says that one day Christ will return. He will call his people up. Heaven and earth will mix together and all sin will be vanish, vanished away. All death will be wiped away. The tears in our eyes will be wiped away. And we will see that wonderful creation that God promised way back in Genesis 1. And it may take a little bit longer, but we know that God is faithful. And that's what we can rest in. We can praise him for his goodness, just as Hosea prophesied, because he is good to us. And he will carry us through as we go. So Jesus has done all that is needed. So again, if you find yourself looking at that story, and, and this is one of those stories that's really heartbreaking because it really doesn't take us that long to figure out where, where we fit in that story. As much as us would like to relate ourselves to Hosea, we're, we're just like the Israelites, which means we're just like Hosea's wife. And that's, and that's a hard pill to swallow, but here's the thing. God has promised goodness to us. He's promised mercy. So as we go into the time of the invitation, the invitation is really simple. Understand that God is faithful to love, God is faithful to forgive, and God is faithful to shed his grace on you. All we have to do is receive it. And if we'll receive that mercy and receive that forgiveness, it will transform us in that horrible situation that we find ourselves in. It will be changed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the day. We thank you for this beautiful story. Lord, we thank you because even though a lot of times we don't like to admit it, we have wandered away. Our hearts are like idol factories. We just find something to distract us, something that is shiny and new in hopes that it will fulfill when the whole time we, you're right there ready to fulfill our every need, our every want. And we pray that today as we go into our Thanksgiving week, we, we ask for rest from the work, but we also ask for a renewed boldness to proclaim your goodness to the world around us because more than anything else this world needs to hear of your goodness and your mercy and your grace and your faithfulness father we ask your spirit to point of any sin that is in is hindering our witness and lord we know that you were faithful to finish the work that you started and so we ask that you continue the work of transforming us into your people who seek after your glory and not our own we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.